Okay, good. So I was just about to start talking about the um, uh, the uh, presentation that I did on Annex B reform, in particular, about the um, the safe module. Um, sorry, yeah, the module syntax aspect of that. So I'm going to break up my recording of that. So hold on. I mean, my, I am for some reason being very dyslexic or something. We're, we're just warming up. It's been a few weeks, right? So. Okay. Can everybody see Annex B reform? Yep. Okay. So. Um, so Annex B has kind of been this dumping ground for uh, things that we needed to codify, but we didn't want to admit into the main spec. And there's been a variety of reasons that things have been dumped into Annex B. Uh, so over here, I want to make some distinctions, and then I'll explain what happened in committee where we actually got consensus on shutting down Annex B and moving everything from Annex B um, uh, in one way or another into the main spec, uh, often preserving the concept of normative optional. Um, uh, and in particular, uh, the issue of optional syntax was a, an especially dangerous notion when the same program might be parsed differently depending on whether or not a given platform recognizes the optional syntax. And that was the case with HTML comments. Uh, the browser-based implementations recognized HTML comments in both strict and sloppy scripts. Um, no, one no one's allowed currently to recognize HTML comments in modules. Um, uh, XS uh, does not recognize them in um, uh, strict or sloppy scripts as it is allowed to because it's optional. Um, and uh, uh, transpilers like Babel, uh, I haven't taken a look at what they actually do, but it would very much surprise me if they had a switch such that they were acted differently depending on whether they consider their input to be, to be script or module. And even less likely is uh, for them to um, pay attention to whether their target uh, is script or module with regard to whether they, they output HTML comments. So uh, for all of these reasons, that was the, the most dangerous thing, which I'll come back to. Uh, but we all, we all agreed to uh, stop doing optional syntax that has that problem. Okay, so um, yeah, this is just sort of a general orientation about all of the reasons why things end up in Annex B and the normative statements introducing Annex B of um, that it's normative, normative uh, optional, meaning that um, you don't have to implement it, but if you do implement it, you have to implement it this way. Uh, also, um, that Annex B specifically, uh, everything there was considered mandatory if the host is a web browser, um, uh, but it was never defined what it means to be a web browser. Uh, is Electron, for example, a web browser? Who knows? Uh, and um, uh, nobody was implementing uh, the same engine to operate differently with regard to Annex B, depending on whether it was run, for example, in, in Node versus being run in a browser. So, so a lot of this was just, um, didn't fit reality tremendously well. So um, uh, this slide is, is um, my, um, the Venn diagram of different distinctions um, to guide us, which is there's ECMAScript as a whole, and it's got, we sort of have two different mechanisms for quarantining um, 
uh, things into not the, the main good spec, which is we can put things into NX B or we can put things in, or we can say the things are sloppy only. And some of the things in Annex B are also things that are stated in Annex B are sloppy only. Um, uh, and uh, what I'm proposing here is that um, uh, we divide, we consider the stuff that's in Annex B uh, that is not sloppy only. Uh, we divide it into things that we consider to be safe versus things that we consider to be unsafe. Uh, this is with regard to um, uh, locality of, ca of causation and um, uh, sort of normal non-magic conformance to object capability rules versus um, strange non-local causality or violations like uh, uh, the ability to get error stacks, like the ability to create uh, weak references. Those would all be, um, uh, well, the, the, we'll come back, well, not, not the weak references, sorry. Uh, the error stacks thing, um, uh, uh, the part of that that's on error.prototype.stack, and then with weak references, there's this, um, uh, political controversy around one particular property. But basically, um, are they magic that introduces potential safety violations or are they just annoying legacy that's actually perfectly safe, like the, uh, the HTML-oriented methods uh, in string.prototype? Uh, and then my recommendation is that of the safe things in Annex B, we just move some of those from their Annex B status into the main stack spec as mandatory. So those are the mandate boxes. Uh, and then uh, other things that, that say stay is they would stay in the category of normative optional. And that was all that I uh, was prepared to recommend when the talk began. And the consensus we ended up with is that the normative optional things actually move into the main spec just very clearly marked as normative optional. And I think that actually reads much better. And Dan Ehrenberg has started some PRs to do that. So here's a complete enumeration of all of the things in Annex B. Um, uh, so um, the things that I'm proposing to mandate that are simply safe, in the uh, upper left box is uh, the global functions escape and unescape. Um, uh, they're you know, not recommended. We might put some deprecated language around them for all the good that that does, which is very little good. Uh, but in any case, they're really de facto uh, required by all implementations, including uh, XS. So we might as well just uh, put them in the main spec. Uh, uh, likewise, the underbar under the dunder proto uh, on object prototype, the accessor property. Um, uh, the only re the putting it into making it normative optional. Uh, one would think that maybe the purpose of that was so that by omitting them, you could you would not need to support mutating prototype chains, but uh, that's not true because reflect dot set prototype of is not normative optional. That's mandated in the main spec. So uh, the Dunder proto property is just another way to uh, cause the same uh, um, consequence, cause the same effect. Uh, so we're not a, a, in, um, accomplishing anything by uh, making it normative optional. Uh, the worst thing is the Dunder proto uh, property name used in an object literal, uh, that's documented in Annex B, which really surprised me. Uh, and it's very damaging for that to be normative optional. It's another one of these cases where uh, the same program text will then mean two different things. Um, uh, in program text that recognizes that as a special case, uh, it will uh, evaluate to an object that inherits from the object that's, um, that the expression to the right of 
uh, the Dunder Protocol and evaluates to. Um, uh, whereas in a uh, implementation that does not recognize the special case, it will simply use defined property semantics to create an own property named Dunder Proto without any interaction with the inherited Dunder Proto uh, and therefore uh, just create a normal object that inherits from object prototype just like any normal uh, object literal does. So that's, that's clearly um, uh, very bad for the same program to be able to mean two different things. Um, uh, the define getter, define setter, lookup getter, lookup setter methods on underbar prototype, I'm sorry, on object.prototype are really best defined as uh, just another way to use um, uh, get on property descriptor, basically as trivial wrappers around get on property descriptor or define property. Uh, and in fact, if they were mandated as that, um, they, more attention would have been paid to them. They would have been tested better and some pr browser bugs, which we currently have with regard to those de facto properties uh, probably would have been avoided. Um, uh, um, sorry, uh, just, just a quick question, particularly about properties that seem to have like, uh, <laughs> like uh, guys, keep it down, um, like underscores uh, in their name. Yeah. Um, so so are, are we saying that they will be permanent? Yes, yes. Uh, and, and, and the fact is that they already exist everywhere. Uh, they were already documented in Annex B. Um, uh, uh, so, um, and that was, I mean, that was part of why they ended up in Annex B is, be, is for the same reason they started off with the double underbars, is the double underbars were kind of saying, we're including this, but we're encouraging people not to use it or some kind of expression of distaste. Um, and, yeah. And it shouldn't be, um, you know, there's enough distaste, distasteful things that are in the main spec that if it's really required everywhere and we don't want variation in program meaning for programs that are not statically rejected, uh, then we should just graduate it to the main spec. And, and, and if we want to, to continue to, um, uh, you know, to, to, have language that says that they're distasteful, like deprecated, that's fine, but it yeah. doesn't really make any difference. I, I, uh, think I was taking a different angle when I was thinking of this is, okay. are they, uh, or can someone overload them? Uh, proto prototypically, can you define a property with that name on an object? Oh yeah, 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 no, no problem at all. So uh, underbar is a valid yeah. identifier start character and an identifier part character. So all of these that you're looking at here, all of them are, are just completely valid vanilla uh, JavaScript identifiers. So, so he, here's where I'm kind of, you know, noticing a, um, like, like that, that's probably why it's been annexed, right? So, so but, but if, you're, if, if those were, you know, special identifiers, and they're not obviously, you, you, you know, they are valid identifiers, um, but it, it just goes that, like, you cannot consider them, um, like, they, they should really be framed in such a way that people using them um, are, are very discouraged. Because when they are annexed, um, a lot of people don't understand why they are in, in the annex, and, and they just consider them not in favor. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so this is the thing about we can try to document them as as discouraged or in or, or deprecated or something, but it doesn't really do any good because if it's implemented everywhere, then uh, portable code is going to use it. Once there's a, a critical mass of portable code using it, then it continues to be required to implement it everywhere, um, and people don't learn the language by reading the spec anyway. Oh, um, they, those who teach sometimes do that, but don't do that correctly. They just do it by reading the spec and, and making sense of it as much as they can. And then yeah. they go about and give all this rhetoric. Okay, so I'm not, I'm, so, so I'm not going to speak uh, about to the, to the issue about 
whether we deprecate them or or say in any other way that they're to be avoided. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna talk about the normative distinctions of is it in the main spec or not, and if it's in the main spec, is it normative optional or not? Um, I also note that these methods are not special. Uh, they can be recreated using modern JavaScript APIs. So, That's right. Uh, even if we call them deprecated, people can do exactly what these methods do. Right. Still. Define, the, the define getter, define setter, lookup getter, lookup setter is just another way of um, doing what you can do with get on property descriptor and define property. Uh, the interesting one with regard to uh, semantics to avoid uh, is the Dunder Proto, but um, since Set prototype of is already mandated. Uh, there's, there's, you can, you can suggest to people not modify prototype chains, which I certainly would suggest that. Um, uh, but that suggestion should apply equally to the existing documentation on reflect.set prototype. Um, yeah. Did you suggest? Did you suggest anything about having engines? Uh, being able to warn people if they use methods? No, the issue didn't come up. Um, okay, doesn't matter then. Move on. Yeah, I, I haven't seen attempts to warn. I also haven't seen those uh, have much actual practical effect, but, but frankly also haven't paid as much attention to warnings. So, so I guess the question um, also would be, um, um, you know, worth, worth um, answering is, uh, you know, if we can do um, statistics on strict mode code, um, is there prevalent use of those in strict mode? Uh, this is very hard to test, actually, because uh, we can check for the source code of non-dynamic lookups. Uh, there is significant enough usage of define getter and define setter that it shows up on NPM queries. I assume due to Babel, it's going to show up in strict mode code because Babel defaults to outputting strict mode. Yeah, early on in Kaha, the, the ECMAScript 5 version of SES, we initially left out the define getter, define setter, lookup getter, lookup setter, uh, and we rapidly found that we needed to put them in and it was non-problematic. Um, so sometimes it's worth fighting uh, to get rid of something when there's a very, very tiny amount of usage, but only if there's a big payoff to getting rid of them. And for these, there's no big payoff for getting rid of them. Um, uh, um, so in any case, the, the um, uh, string.prototype methods um, uh, the extra ones that were in NXB are, are harmless. I'll show them in a moment. Uh, likewise, the extra methods on date.prototype. Um, uh, with regard to um, the things that are in sloppy mode uh, that were also in NXB, uh, the fact that they're in sloppy mode, um, uh, to my mind, is adequate quarantine. They don't need to be both in sloppy mode and in NXB. Um, so that's primarily the syntaxes you see down here. Um, uh, um, uh, sloppy mode accepts uh, octal literals uh, using the old leading zero syntax. Uh, you can directly label a function as opposed to just labeling blocks. Um, uh, it's got bizarre scoping semantics for defining a named function inside a non-top level block. Um, whereas uh, in strict mode, defining a function, named function inside a non-top level block has straightforward lexical scoping semantics. Um, for legacy reasons, in sloppy mode, it has bizarre semantics that nobody who doesn't implement or, or write a spec can possibly remember. Um, and then also in sloppy mode, you can use functions di uh, directly as branches, as control flow branches for things like ifs and whiles and such. Um, so let's just go ahead and mandate all of those. Let's just really, really shy away from ever making um, uh, syntactic things optional. 
Um, the sloppy mode on the lower right, uh, that's stuff that's currently not in Annex B. It doesn't appear anywhere in the spec in terms of the sloppy semantics for call or callee and arguments. Um, but uh, at least all the browsers feel like they need to implement them. Uh, I would continue to have them listed. I mean, I, I, I think that they should be codified. I'd be happy to leave those as normative optional rather than mandating them. Uh, but because um, uh, when you do implement them you in sloppy mode as things that do something, as things that are not poisoned, uh, you should implement them to have their expected meaning. That's sort of the purpose for which we have normative optional. Um, and then finally, the upper right box is the things that are not sloppy only um, that I'm recommending remain normative optional. Regex.prototype.compile uh, has this bizarre semantics that actually violates uh, the uh, frozen invariants. Um, uh, so you, you can do this to a regex instance that is already frozen. Uh, regex instances do have one own property uh, index or something, uh, and compile can cause that property to change state even on a frozen regex instance. Uh, oh, so, la last index? Last index, yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so uh, certainly every SES, one of the things that it does to tame its environment is it removes regex.prototype.compile. One of the purposes for keeping things as normative optional uh, and deletable. So actually there, there's two requirements, that if it's present, it be deletable and that, it, that, that you can conform uh, uh, while omitting it. And that means that a startup thing like SES can, can delete them since they're deletable, and then having deleted them, the remaining environment is itself still a conforming initial JavaScript environment. So um, one question about um, regex prototype, um, you know, freezing-wise. Um, if you have a, um, an expression that executes it will mutate the last index as well. Not if the regex instance is frozen. Okay, so I haven't really tested that, um, but uh, anyone using the regex um, uh, class, like instance, would expect last index to give them a hint of, you know, post exec what happened. Well, it's certainly worth testing. I would appreciate it if somebody would test that. Um, yeah. I have, I have not tested it. Yeah, I, I have stayed away from freezing re regex um, objects uh, because, you know, um, I, like I've noticed DOM elements have this like, okay, you can freeze me, but like, you know, it <laughs> doesn't really do anything, right? Um, so so I, I'm just worried that because uh, last index is um, updated you know, I, I believe it actually throws an error. Like, I have to test. I'm, I'm going to document it for next meetup. Yeah, it, it, what, what we sh if there's an issue there, and if there's an issue there, and we can't get everybody to agree, don't mutate the last index, then what we should do instead is um, make last index an accessor property instead of a data property. Uh, and maybe even have it be an, an accessor property that's on regex prototype so that it gets inherited. Uh, and then the last index state would then be on an internal slot. Yeah. And it does not violate anything for an internal slot to get mutated on a frozen object. It, yeah, so, it replicates but, array's length, right? The length of an array, that property, you can't really um, uh, that can that cannot be mutated. Um, the uh, array length cannot be mutated on a frozen array. Yeah, or, or a regular one in terms of redefining it. So uh, it does end up redefining it. So in, the, in that sense, uh, length acts as an accessor property in that it has special behavior, but uh, it doesn't violate the freezing constraints. So in that so in that sense, yeah. it's not inaccurate. For yeah. length, the data property. Yeah, frozen array doesn't change length, so length will always be constant, even if it's not like 
actually um, unsettable on any level. Like it, it, it still remains that had this array been um, not frozen, the length would have changed and the runtime might have um, um, given a different value for length, but it doesn't, right? Um, but that is not the same for last index. So, so we need to test the last index. As far as I know, uh, last index is only mutated uh, uh, on a frozen instance by compile, which is why I put compile on this list. But we definitely should test it. Um, uh, the other thing that's that's here that's um, uh, uh, in annex, currently in Annex B is document dot all, uh, which is this incredibly bizarre legacy thing, uh, for which the spec very very clearly says uh, there is only this one special case of this odd behavior, where for some purposes some purposes it acts like an object. And for other purposes, it acts like undefined. It's like a complete violation of JavaScript semantics uh, as normally understood. And uh, we will continue to say that it should only be implemented by browsers and it should only be implemented for this one particular property. Um, uh, but we should go ahead and move it into the main spec as normative optional with all of those qualifiers. Is document.all deletable? I don't know if it's deletable. I believe it isn't. You might be right. Um, that's I, I, I think delete on a Yulio, the undefined like objects, uh, has no effect. I don't know. Um, can somebody test it? I mean, it seems like a simple enough thing to test. Uh, I'm projecting and recording, so somebody else could test it. I'm sorry, like uh, which which uh, delete 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 in a in a browser in a you know in a, in a REPL uh, in a browser like under the debugger. Just say delete document dot all. And then see if it's gone. Or actually, just does does delete itself return true? Oh, delete itself. Delete um, of document dot all. Does that return true? Yeah. It does. It does. Okay. Um, that's encouraging. Um. Uh, then there's uh, these two bizarre pieces of, uh, so um, I'll, I'll, I'll mention the syntaxes first because those are in, currently in um, uh, Annex B. Then I'll go talk about the other things that I haven't mentioned so far. So there's, uh, for the in the for in syntax, you, there's this um, uh, 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 ability for it to recognize an initializer so you can say var x equals y in, and for for in, having an initializer there makes no sense. But uh, somebody, one of the browser, we at one point the spec tried to remove it. One of the browsers tried implementing it, found that there were still too many sites that broke, even though it's completely useless and meaningless syntactic construction. So it came back in. Um, uh, I don't remember if that's sloppy only or not. I remember one of the one of these two things that I have there turned out to be sloppy only. So it was less of an issue than I was worried about. Um, uh, the other one is um, inside a catch block. If there is a var declaration inside the block that looks like it's shadowing the catch variable, um, uh, there is something that's normative optional about whether that's an error or not. And I don't even remember which way it goes. Um, uh, uh, so, um, uh, but, but both of those have the feature that having the syntax normative optional does not enable one program text to mean two different things because in the other interpretation where it's not, where it is, is or is not recognized, 
uh, the behavior would be a static error. Um, so having, having optional syntax where uh, one alternative is that you have a working program and the other alternative is that you have a static error, uh, that's much less damaging. I'm um, sorry, I had a question though, um, just for clarity. Um, in, in those particular uh, mentions, uh, did anyone talk about uh, if people use let instead of var in those cases, how, 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 the, um, how that would be different compared think, to var? Uh, there was not, I don't remember anybody discussing it. I know that it was considered when this was originally happening. Uh, and I think the let case is not problematic because that because lets do not hoist out of blocks. Mm -hmm. Therefore, my suspicion is that that means it just shadows without a problem. Uh, but that's under an assumption about what the scope of the catch variable is. Uh, so you would need to double check that. I, I have to admit that on these issues, I just listed them for completeness and so that we could make a determination. I did not dive into the meanings of, or motivations for, for those particular things in any detail. Um, uh, I'll come to HTML comments last. So the regexp.star, those are the weird regexp statics um, that are currently proposed They're not uh, to be for NXB. Uh, they're not yet They've not yet made it all the way through the stands process, but they're universally implemented. Um, uh, they're not currently universally implemented correctly because uh, on one of the browsers, I think Firefox, uh, they're not actually deletable. So SES has to do something bizarre to effectively delete them anyway, which we do. Um, uh, but in any case, uh, they, they will become standard. They should become standard as normal, normative optional and deletable as they're currently proposed. Um, uh, uh, the uh, error stack traceback proposal uh, proposes uh, two systems, um, uh, 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 system methods, get stack and get stack traceback. I'm sorry, get stack and get stack string, uh, uh, which we um, which I now have a shim of, uh, and those would be on, um, you know, in namespace that's, that's for systemy things that are thereby um, uh, uh, by prearrangement uh, omittable, uh, uh, censorable, and virtualizable, uh, which things that, that introduce new special authorities should be. Uh, but then there's the property error.prototype.stack as an accessor property that, that is inherited by error instances. And that one continues to need to be normative optional because uh, that one by being reachable from error prototype is necessarily shared by all compartments inside the same root realm. Um, and therefore, cannot be differentially uh, virtualized. It can't be the case that you make it available to in one compartment of the root realm and not make it available or make a different virtualization of it available to another compartment in the same root realm. Um, so uh, what SES will do um, uh, is to remove the behavior of error pro prototype stack and only use the um, uh, the get stack and get stack string uh, systemy things, um, uh, and uh, sim and uh, uh, there's a similar issue with specifically the property weak ref dot prototype dot constructor, uh, which is uh, we do not we want it to be the case that. Uh, I can give, um, I can give out a, a re weak ref instance that's a weak ref for a particular thing, uh, give that to some code such that it can now observe whether that particular thing gets garbage collected uh, without enabling that code to create other weak refs. Um, 
uh, that enable it to, to observe whether other things get garbage collected. Um, and the only thing that stands in the way of that is this one property. Uh, except for this property, there's no way to navigate from a weak ref instance to a weak ref constructor. And there is existing uh, precedent in the spec for not having a constructor property on the prototype. So for example, uh, the map iterator prototype does not have a constructor property, does not have its own constructor property. And if you say on a map iterator dot constructor, you get an inherited constructor. And there's a few things in the spec like that. Um, um, so one question about the weak ref, um, you, you could actually potentially um, consider that in most cases, you're not really giving the weak ref itself, you're, you have an accessor on something that, that depends you know, on, on what that weak ref that it hides um, um, you know, if, you know, so, so the accessor returns true or false, um, or, 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 you know, the side effect of true or false, uh, without actually, uh, exposing the weak ref that it, uh, you know, caters. So, so I'm not sure what you mean by accessor in this context. You could certainly do a wrapper. Yeah. Like you would wrap it behind a property on some object that you expose as, you know, yeah. to, so that, so you could, you could do that, but then you're just, you're, you're creating a problem and then you're working around a created problem and it's better to just not create the problem in the first place. Um, uh, but yes, if, 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 if we didn't have agreement for the constructor property to be optional, uh, then we would have to work around it in that way. Uh, and we should support working around it in a standardized way, which is a lot more added complexity than just omitting the constructor property. My preference would be that we don't make it normative optional, but rather we just omit it we mandate that it be omitted, but I'm failing to get consensus on that. Um, and then finally, there is um, uh, the most ugly thing, which is the HTML-like comments. Um, and the problem is that when they're not recognized as syntax, they can be a valid operator sequence. You know, operand less than uh, the negation of the pre-decrement or something, or some or operand post-decrement is greater than something. Um, uh, so you can write programs that change their meaning. Um, so we got, cons so even though all of us hate this thing and wish we could avoid it, we know that we can't, and normative optional is even worse than mandating something we hate everywhere. So we got agreement in committee to simply mandate this um, uh, for scripts, both strict and sloppy. Uh, and then there was an, an additional issue that was mentioned uh, that I, I raised in my presentation. I made a recommendation. Uh, we should look at the notes, but I don't think we came to a consensus on what to do about them, uh, which is what do you do about these things in modules? Uh, in modules right now, modules mandate the clean thing, which is they don't recognize these things at all. But the problem is, especially with things like transpilers and or-, or So I can short circuit the transpiler comments. I'm sorry? Uh, I can short circuit some of the transpiler discussion. Uh, okay. And I think that would be useful. Uh, okay. The main parsers, ES Prima, Babylon, uh, TypeScript, and also uh, Acorn, all have a input flag. Most are now requiring you to declare if the source text you're parsing is supposed to be a script or a module. And inside the module flagged format, they do not support HTML comments. Okay. Uh, they haven't for quite a while, but if you go back far enough, I know Babel does. I think it's like four years ago. Okay, well that's good news. That means that uh, the status quo where they're not recognized in modules uh, is more plausible than I had feared. Um, so we might just leave that as the status quo. Um, so but there's a side to this though. Um, most of them support uh, what they call unambiguous formats or uh, detection of if something is a script or a module. 
And most of those formats do support both module syntax and script syntaxes at the same time. Yeah, and since, uh, since HTML-like comments enable a program to mean two different things, you could in fact write a program that if HTML comments are recognized, the program is consistently recognized as a script and if HTML like, and you know, for example, it does not contain an import or export statement. And if HTML like comments are not recognized, then it does contain an ex import or export statement so that recognizing it either as a script or as a module would both be a consistent story. And of course you can do the opposite. So you have a paradox, which is if it's a script, it's a module. And if it's a module, it's a script. So, so, so any kind of self-detection is really quite, a, quite disastrous here. What I recommended, which I still prefer, and what SES currently does, uh, is that uh, if they are detected, then the program is statically rejected. So instead of worrying about, well, what should the program mean if these things appear, if they appear, just statically reject the program. Say, if I'm not confident that I can interpret this program to mean what the programmer intended it to mean, then I'm doing the programmer a favor by just rejecting the program. Um, so that's what I recommended. Um, uh, that continues to be what I, the outcome I would most favor, and it is what the SES shim currently does. Uh, let me just go through my little word bubbles here, which is, uh, yeah. expands out the stars. Be before, uh, before the bubbles, uh, sorry, back to comments one second, because I, I was really trying to make sense of what the spec, uh, the annex P, like the annex part was, was really uh, uh, describing that this should parse as. And I was having a lot of difficulty with the language as to whether or not they were saying that if it overlapped with a multi-line comment, that one of them can begin where the other, you know, they, 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 they're not encapsulating one another. It's not like the beginning of a comment could be the multi-line and the end of it could be the HTML-like ender. Like there was a very, very weird um, uh, thing happening there that, you know, for Annex B, you know, they, they just say that, you know, it, we're putting it so people would not be surprised if it happened. But well, now... They, but they do have to specify precisely, which they, uh, which I certainly attempted to do in Annex B. Yeah, but you know, like it's not as much. It doesn't get as much um, uh, critique. Yeah, uh, the, the nature of things, right? So, but if so it's now, so now suggesting that they be, be made mandatory for scripts and therefore would get that kind of attention. Uh, yeah. With regard to what the rules are, the fact that they act like line comments, not block comments even though in HTML itself, they're more like block comments, uh, which is just co so completely bizarre. Um, uh, one of the things that I did in introducing the topic uh, at TC39 is I took, I first started with a poll of the room. I said, everyone here who has worked on a conforming JavaScript parser, please raise your hand. And this being TC39, a lot of hands went up, a lot of hands did not go up. And then I said, Okay, everybody who just raised your hand, keep your hand down for the next poll. Um, for everyone else, uh, if you think you know precisely what the parsing rules are for HTML-like comments, please raise your hand. And one hand went up, which is Aki, and, uh, and Aki explained that Leo Balter uh, who um, had had just explained to her in some detail about this, and otherwise she she would not have known. So so essentially, nobody who does not work on a parser knows what the rules are for this thing anyway. Yeah. Um, if it's mandated, I definitely hope that uh, you know someone with a bit of knowledge. I, I believe I do qualify would be able to make sense of, of what they're really uh, indicating because um, like if, if it's just going to be moved over, I think that would be problematic. Um, 
but um, if we're moving things, mandating things, maybe the, a, a second look at, at the text of what is being moved would be um, the, you know, the default recommendation for anything mandated that wasn't before. I mean, the, all, yeah, I mean, all of these things should have text that's consistent with the care of the rest of the spec. That should even be the case with them in Annex B, but I can believe that, that we've just put less care into it. Yeah, um, it's it's as, the of, as of we're, knowing that it is Annex B, right? So yeah. So, so yeah. As, as we're talking about this, another option comes up, uh, com comes to mind that we did not come up at TC39, which is instead of simply unconditionally mandating them, we could do something more like what I'm recommending for modules, but in this case say that um, uh, there's, there, you, the, what's mandated is one of two options. Either they're recognized with their stand, their, their, the, the, the specified meaning, which is line comments, or it causes the script to be statically rejected. And that way you would enable both scripts and modules, you at least allow them to statically reject. And that's a, and that as mentioned earlier, is a form of optionally recognized syntax that is not so harmful. So, uh, and that's what in, what in fact I would like to continue doing in SES, which is statically reject both scripts and modules if these things seem to have appeared in them. And so in SES, if they appear inside a comment, they also uh, get rejected? Yes. Huh. Yeah, in, in, SES, in the SES shim, this, is not, this does not show up, at least not yet, uh, in the SES spec, but that's what I'm doing in the shim. Yeah. Uh, the, the shim, remember that the shim is layered in such a way that the core of the shim uh, does not depend on huh. an accurate parser yeah. for its security. Uh, so I actually just look for these with the regexp, and if I detect them, then I reject. And that's, that's simply what the shim does, and it's what, what I believe the, the shim should continue to do, because anything else is too dangerous. Um, and now for completeness, I'll just walk through the, the word bubbles that expand out the stars. Um, String.prototype, uh, the only additional methods there are substir, which is another way to say slice. There's the weird HTML methods, each of whom are trivial. Uh, it's one of the rare cases where browser semantics leaked into the core language. And then there's trim left and trim right. Um, uh, for date, there's get year and set year, which gives you two digit years instead of four digit years. So it it's, creates a danger of a y two, Y2K problem. And this being 19 years after Y2K, I'm not sure how, how worried we should be anyway, but in any case, they're universally implemented, likewise to GMT string. And then uh, the regex stat, the regex um, uh, static properties are all of this weird non-local um, global communication um, uh, danger uh, static properties that uh, are just information about the last regexp instance match that happened for any regexp instance in this realm. Yeah, it's just they, they call those the uh, legacy reg, uh, regex um, um, uh, statics or something like that. And yeah. I, I'm just wondering why they're not a prototype thing because obviously if you have last index, and those are last whatever of an expression. You, 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 I, think, I think you're assuming much more sense uh, or much more rationale. These things were already there in ES3 by the time I started participating in the committee. Yeah. And any, any, anything that, that predates, um, uh, you know, the ES4 versus ES3.1 debate uh, is just whatever crap we inherited from ES3. Um, yeah. Like whoever is using that in code is like, definitely not getting what, whatever they're, they think they're getting. Yeah, so, so SES Kaha has always just deleted them. And we've actually never run across a program that broke because we deleted them. 
uh, but there's but you know our tolerance for breaking programs is much higher than the tolerance of the browser manufacturers for for breaking programs, and for very good reason. So that's why we put it as normative optional. And, uh, that that's that's it for uh, this presentation, which. Um, so I did some dirty checking on document all. Uh, mm -hmm. You can't get rid of it. You and cannot a way to get rid of it. You cannot delete it. Uh, can't delete it. Can't overwrite it. It's just there. Wow. You cannot define a property that shadows it. No, because it doesn't have a property. That's why it's so weird. Okay. Ah, okay. So it's like an evolved thing. You know, it's it's higher than than anything uh, in existence. I guess. All right. Uh, guys, like. Oh God. Um, I guess it's a good uh, um, um, opportunity with the three of us to just talk about trusted pipes uh, at some point in this meeting. Um, I'm, I'm just going to have to run out for a couple of minutes, and I'll be back if, if you guys don't mind, okay? Okay. Sure. So, Mark, well, I've got you here for a minute. Um, I spent most of my paternity leave trying to figure out a good way to allow garbage collection within a single realm of modules. Uh, and I just can't see any feasible way to do that with the current uh, language semantics we've got for JavaScript. So for now. You're talking about the node uh, interagent cycle issue? Uh, yes. OK. But uh, I mean, it shows up without other agents. It's just isolated realms. Um, whenever we're going to go through with this, we're probably going to end up having to just say that the lifetime of a module is tied to the realm which created it. Um, all forms that allow distributed collection uh, require deep uh, garbage collection, garbage collection cooperation, which we don't get enough of from weak refs because we don't want to expose some uh, privy information. So and, and weak refs wouldn't help anyway because they only help with uh, acyclic gar uh, inter realm garbage. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, but if they're not separate agents, then why aren't they within the scope of a shared garbage collector? If, it sh if one garbage collector can see the whole cycle, then it can collect it. Uh, we do not allow uh, the loader code to directly access and therefore plug these things together. The whole point of this is to isolate the loader so that user code cannot get to it. And I cannot find any way to get the loader to properly make cycles due to okay. timing problems if we do that. Okay. So, uh, so what do you recommend? So for now, I think just going forward, at least for our first ship, uh, shippable product, we're going to have to just say the lifetime of a module is that of the realm which created it. And we're going to have to go down a route of looking at how we can make many realms and coordinate deletion of realms to free up uh, space. So uh, the realm seems, I don't, I don't understand why the realm is the, first of all, I assume you're talking about a root realm, um, but uh, even that is too no. small for the, for, to meet the constraints of the problem. You can have any, any realm. I, I'm sorry? I, any realm. So even compartments. I, so I don't understand how that would meet the constraints because you can have multiple root realms that are part of one shared object graph under one garbage collector. In fact, you need to. Um, yes. uh, in the browser, this comes up with same origin iframes. So it would, it would seem like 
the constraint you're talking about where the cycle comes up um, between garbage collectors, uh, the unit that you would have to tie the lifetime to would have to be the entire object graph that was within the visibility of one garbage collector, no? Um, I'm not sure I understand your point. Uh, so let's, okay, so, you, so you've got one object graph, you've got root realm A and root realm B. And root realm B has loaded module M. Uh, because of the shared object graph, uh, module M is reachable from objects that were born as part of root realm A. Um, yep. uh, and then root realm B is otherwise garbage, but A still holds on to M. Yep. Uh, doesn't the same problem cause, I mean, it doesn't, it didn't matter that, that root realm B was otherwise garbage. As long as A is holding on to it, it's held on to. And then if the thing in A that's holding on to it is itself only held, is only non-garbage because it's part of an external cycle, that still pins the module. It still doesn't allow you to garbage collect the module. Um, not necessarily. Um, the object in A could delete its reference to M, which could allow B to be garbage collected, which would then garbage collect M. Um, well, I mean that, that A, is, A is only holding on to M and is not holding on to anything else from B. Uh, correct. Uh, and M, you, would, M would keep B alive anyway. Uh, according to current semantics of the language, unless uh, an engine does some very drastic things, which none do currently. Okay, so you're saying that um, a module that's born into a realm already keeps its realm alive. Correct. And, and therefore saying that the, okay, so the, so the module keeps its realm alive, but it's not yet the case that the realm keeps its module alive, and you're proposing that the realm always keep its module alive. Uh, correct. Um, so effectively, if you have 10,000 different variant attenuations of M, it would keep those 10,000 alive if they're all generated within the same realm B forever until B is garbage collected. Because, so actually, so, so something I'm not understanding here. Um, within an import namespace, within what's, you know, what we've been thinking of uh, as the, the, the loader or the registry of a loader or something, uh, there's already a canonical mapping from something like a module specifier, some kind of, you know, uh, resolved specifier, a canonical mapping of that to a module instance, and a module instance um, uh, potentially has mutable state that uniquely happens for that instance on initialization. So I already don't see how it would seem to me that once an instance has been loaded into a registry, has been registered in a registry under some kind of global specifier, that as long as that global specifier could be regenerated, that the same instance would have to be reproduced. And therefore, um, the registry would, would already, even without this, this inter-agent cycle, that the registry would already have to retain all module instances that it, that it ever instantiated. Is that not the case? That is not the case currently, but that's what I think we must assert as de facto required. 
So how could it not be the case currently? That's what I'm confused about. If the about. ID cannot be regenerated, if it is uh, some referential ID instead of a string, for example. Okay. So, so the specifiers are uh, a string, but the actual lookup operation is a reference to the importing module or undefined if it's a root, and then the string. So you do have references that you can use to generate uh, unique IDs that cannot be forged. Okay, so, 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 uh, so, so if this has the semantic, if this mapping has, has a weak map like semantics, or in fact, if under the hood it's implemented as a you know, weak map to a map, um, uh, you know, weak map from the um, unforgeable identifiers to, to, to a map from strings to module instances, then uh, if the unforgeable identifier was dropped, it would, it would allow the rest of it to be dropped but under what conditions could the unforgeable identifier be dropped? Uh, so essentially the unforgeable identifier could be dropped if the module can no longer be loaded ever again. Um, there are various ways to do this. Uh, a lot of code that does hot reloading, if you're familiar with that technique, does this. They delete, it's essentially, if you could delete something from the registry. That's that's when it would happen. Okay, so so okay, so it's not happening automatically. It's happening as a result of a programmatic deletion. Uh, so under your, um, um, it could happen automatically. Like I said, if in your example, Realm A's, if Realm A deleted M, it's reference to M. It could have a, another module. Let's say. X within realm B that is suddenly up for garbage collection as well. I see, I see. Once you can delete one thing, that that deletion can cascade in other deletions. Yes. Okay, that makes sense to me. Now, under your proposed semantics, even if, even if the program programmatically does that first deletion, it would not result in garbage collection of the of the thing explicitly deleted, or of the things that that cas cascades into. Uh, in the current common JS loaders, it does not. Okay. Um, we could uh, try to enforce that in module loaders. I do not think it is reasonable or feasible. Okay. Okay. So currently, everybody's living with those things not getting garbage collected. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, but, and since the module holds its realm alive, and you're proposing that the realm holds its module alive, um, then anything that So if, if module A and module B were both part of one object graph, but A dropped all pointers into both B and, its in, and the module instances in B, uh, then um, uh, B as a whole could disappear, even though the overall object graph it was part of continues to exist? Uh, as long as A's are, as long as A's module namespace can no longer be referenced, that is true. Yes. Okay. 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 Um, well, this, my this, not, this sounds, I'm sorry, go ahead. Under my proposal, uh, even if B deleted or uh, no longer had any reference to A's module namespace, uh, the fact that A and B are in the same realm or it would keep A alive. I was assuming that A and B are 
separate realms, but one right. object graph, as in same origin iframes. No, no. Then if they are if they are separate realms, then uh, B would not inherently be keeping A alive, as long okay. as it holds all uh, direct references that are keeping A's realm alive. Okay. Okay. Um, this this sound this all sounds plausible enough to me. It's obviously you know not the ideal I would like if I could wave a magic wand, but if the other engineering constraints push us into this, this seems like a a an okay place to be. Um, a quick question I have there: um, all references of a module can be dropped, then it could be dynamically re-imported. Um, have you factored in on whether or not that re-instantiates a new instance of the... Um, so there are two situations here. There's one if the module is stored in the global module map, uh, re-importing uh, it somehow later uh, would always give you the original instance because the module map keeps it alive forever. It can't be garbage collected. The other is for ideas like vm.module. Those are the unforgeables we're talking about. Um, vm.module, uh, you cannot re-import it once it's been garbage collected by definition. So um, it's yeah. just not possible. So, so if, if, if that vm.module was uh, like, well, yeah, obviously if it's garbage collected, that's one thing. But I mean, if it, if it could be allowed to be garbage collected, um, if it was the side effect of somewhere, you importing a string and whatever me mechanisms were in the middle, um, led, led that string in that realm to import a particular module, dynamically importing the same string after all references were gone, regardless of how you give the illusion of a module or actually implement it, uh, should not result in top-level execution and, and recreation of all the, um, um, you know, of, 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 of anything, um, you know, um, for, for that specific URL. You see what my concern here? Like, if, if we are I mean, wrong. I need something clarified. Are you talking about re importing within the same module? So, let's say we have a module that imports dynamically a, another module, F, and then it deletes its reference to F and then has like a set timeout and imports F again. Yeah, in a realm, if a module does that and we are... Within the same source text, not within a realm. Uh, are, are we talking about different source text? Uh, no, uh, the same source text um, um, in, in two dynamic import calls, calling the same URL. Um, you would expect that that same URL would not instantiate more than once. Ever. Correct. That has a different module map from the realms module map. That's the local module map as mandated by the spec. So once you import into a source text module record uh, something, you are required that that reference to that specifier always point to the resolved module reference. So uh, if you import something, it cannot be garbage collected in yeah. the same source text record. So this isn't, it's not possible for you to so, uh, have it be for GC. So, so what I was thinking here, uh, Brad, is uh, realm beings, uh, you know, within that behavior happening, you know, you know above it on, on, a, on a grander level, then you would expect that behavior to hold within a realm as well that uh, around um, dynamic imports of the same string, uh, regardless of how it relates to uh, the containment process within the you know, uh, parent or the root module uh, map behaviors, um, you would expect that if there is um, a, a, a string to module instance uh, you know, 
through a dynamic import statement in a realm that 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 irrespective of how it connects to the big you know the global uh, module map in a realm it should remain that it doesn't construct a new instance uh that's not currently true in node or browsers uh, can you give an example for the browsers? Uh, easiest one is you make an import map. Uh, you let's say import map is to HTTP example.com slash foo. Um, and you have two uh, modules that that thing is importing two different scopes. They're both overriding uh, example.com slash bar. Uh, the full URL to point to different absolute URLs. And so you could import uh, example.com bar in one module, have it delete it, and then in a different source text module record, import example.com slash bar and get a different module record resulting in new instantiation and evaluation. But we're, we're talking here about just import maps being the, uh, the you know, the reason why this is possible. Um, and I, I think for Chrome, the only browser that has import maps um, flagged, I believe, uh, it's not even possible at this point to um, define an import map. Like I get errors. Uh, unless it's for a built-in, so it's like it's really only out in the wild for maybe if, if they're like origin-based uh, um, rollouts. I'm not sure, but um, for me, it gives an error if if I'm not shadowing uh, for a built-in, like using a custom um, URL that falls back on one of the built-ins, and then I'm allowed to actually fall back on a on a um, on a polyfill, which really doesn't work for other browsers because they don't support that now. So, so import map, maps has a lot of like, uh, if we get there, then we can figure out all these problems. Um, but I mean, it's still true that you could do the same thing, except instead of example.com slash bar, it would be std colon kv. Yeah, I mean, other than import maps allowing it to be the case. It's not. Um, kind of. Uh, I'm not entirely sure that's true regarding blob URLs. I do not believe it's true. It's true. Blob URLs have to be uh, unique. If they are real, no, overlap. They do overlap in real implementations. Um, in a in a in a particular browser context, you will never get the same blob uh, URL twice. Uh, is that that's new? That, no, like that. That's 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 in the spec, but uh, is that actually enforced now? Like, I'm not sure. Um, like, I've never hit a point where I could prove it. Like, I didn't go try to disprove it or prove it, but it's been, um, you know, it's been um, kind of like the, the principle behind you not really deciding what the, what the blob, um, uh, you know, suffix or the blob number is or whatever they call that, um, is that they are trying so hard to make sure that you tell the blob what it will have, and then it will tell you what it will be. Um, uh, you know, so so that like um, um, paradoxical way of you know making it impossible for you to use it um, to inject code after knowing who's receiving it. So so I'll be I'll be amazed if if same uh, blob um, number is is reused or hash is reused. Um. Well, the point still stands that you can forge these, or at least under current directions, you will be able to. Um, there's nothing in the spec that prevents you from doing this behavior. Aside from not knowing that you've instantiated 
whatever that mod module reflects more than one. So if we're talking custom element, a custom um, element. I don't understand. What do you mean you've, you've instantiated the module more than once? Like if, if the module results in records somewhere when it's evaluated, like the top level code of the module somehow affects your uh, state, you know, the state of things, not just ECMAScript code, uh, for which ECMAScript is an interface, then uh, rerunning that code again because um, you garbage collected the first instance, um, you know, in, um, in the context upon which the ECMAScript realm um, operates or, or, you know, um, is an interface, sorry, uh, then, um, then you will be rerunning um, that code again if it's re-imported, and that would affect the contextual state um, um, in, in unpredictable ways. Uh, for, for anyone writing code to be able to predict. Uh, I, I'm still unclear on this because if it's been garbage collected, it cannot be instantiated again. You have to generate a new module record. Well, it, it, we're seeing here that I'm calling the same string with dynamic import. And uh, yeah, you, you know, unaware uh, from, from, from someone authoring the code referring to a string, they would be unaware that the implementation is actually garbage collecting and recreating a new module record at some level. Um, so, so if it's not, if it's not, if it's not made concretely um, uh, restrictive, that a string in a dynamic import should never result in a recreation uh, or anything in a dynamic import should actually be um, garbage collector, then, then we're, we're really creating this um, opportunity for unpredictable behavior from very predictable code. I, I don't understand because you, can, you cannot instantiate something a second time if it's gone. It simply ceases to be if it's been garbage collected. Well, again, so don't garbage collect it if it can be re dynamically imported under the semantics uh, of me writing a string, expecting a string to return the same thing. Uh, that, is, that is currently not possible due to ECMAScript uh, within the same source text module record. So um, I, I just don't understand how it would be possible to encounter this scenario. So, so yeah, I guess um, I guess you know we're, we're trying to clarify uh, from two different from two opposite ends or two uh, different perspectives on, on a problem. Um, uh, I guess implementation-wise, if it if it creates a problem, we'll be able to maybe um, have a better, uh, like a more productive or a, a more constructive uh, way to look at it. Uh, for now, I think, you know, we, we tried. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. All right. Uh, I could go over the TC39 agenda and just um, see what occurs to me to talk about to recap what happened during the meeting. I'm going to have to head out, but thanks, everyone. Hey, thank you. All right, thanks. Is this the first meeting since TCC 39? It is, yes. Okay. I've been out of it for a few weeks, so I don't know what's going on right now. Okay. Or at least it's the first meeting that I've attended since TC 39. I don't know, don't know if any meetings happened in my absence. Yeah, like I, I attended all of them alone. <laughs> So no, like uh, there hasn't been much attendance really uh, for for like three weeks or four weeks. Everybody has assumed um, no attendance. <laughs> okay. So can everybody see agenda for seventieth meeting? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay.
so um, actually, I'm going to do this non-sequentially because um, the most interesting thing uh, was a academic um, that does research on uh, programmer psychology and uh, how people interact with programming languages. Here we go. Uh, Feline Hermans, uh, evidence-based programming language design. Um, uh, Yulia invited her. Yulia did a presentation immediately afterwards on uh, her own work that's um, uh, uh, on probing some JavaScript issues that are very much in line with that academic framework. Uh, and I thought all of that was just fascinating. And I really like the way in which um, that's being brought into our discussion. The, the particular thing that Yulia uh, was applying this to was um, uh, uh, the pipe, the proposed pipe syntax uh, to evaluate um, uh, whether it actually, uh, how it actually affects the experience of programming in JavaScript. Does it make it easier or harder to write correct programs? Uh, and exploring this in the context of, it's not an isolated feature, but it coexists with the rest of the language. Um, and both uh, Feline and Yulia were um, uh, very clear on the methodological limitations that uh, this stuff is a long way from giving us the kind of confidence that we should um, uh, either believe the evidence or demand it. Uh, but at the same time, it is ev additional evidence to take into account um, and uh, addition of new syntax should in general need to pass a very high bar on um, reasons to accept it. Uh, so um, evidence along, experimental evidence along these lines um, uh, uh, could be a significant contributor um, uh, in an argument about whether or not to add new syntax. Um, the particular uh, um, the, uh, experiment that Yulia conducted is clear that it was more that this first, since that was her first one, it was more of an experiment on how to perform such experiments. Uh, you know, Yulia learned a lot more about how to go about this in order to create valuable experiments that do give us valuable information. Uh, but this one itself should not be interpreted as having given us valuable information about the pipe syntax itself. Okay, now let's go back uh, sequentially. Um, so Mike Samuel presented uh, several things that fit together that lead or are supportive of the trusted types thing, but trusted types, oh, and, and, oh, and he did present on trusted types, I'm seeing, um, with slides. Um, but trusted types are not being proposed to TC39. Uh, so it's more of a background and the other things that are supportive of it are being proposed. So eval of a non-string, um, uh, the current eval spec says that if you uh, apply eval to anything other than a string, it just acts as the identity function. It doesn't evaluate anything and it just returns that thing. Um, and what um, uh, Mike wants to do with uh, trusted types is to enable some kind of branding of a string wrapper such that in an environment in which evaluation is otherwise suppressed, a branded string wrapper carrying a string could be fed to an evaluator. And, that, and to do that, the first part of the reform is needing to reform the structure of the eval uh, specification itself so that you have a good place to hook in order to enable the conditional approval of a branded string wrapper. Um, okay. Uh, the name property for anonymous functions, that was really just fixing a, um, an omission in the spec that I'm going to say was an accidental omission. Um, that uh, when we added name properties, settable name properties to functions, we should have done it uniformly for all functions. Um, uh, next one, uh, the resolve property for promise 
Paul was just making it more consistent with other things in the spec in order to support efficiency uh, without penalty. Um, uh, let all errors be syntax errors. Um, uh, for for um, unmotivated reason, there were some early errors for some syntactic cases that threw reference error rather than syntax errors. We all agreed that should, those should all be syntax errors. I don't even remember what the quarter option is. Uh, day period and milliseconds, millisecond digits. Uh, but those both sound either like internationalization or temporal. Right. They're international. Yeah, all, they, all three of those were um, ECMO 402 Intel. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, dynamic import. Uh, that I um, at the previous meeting, uh, I had asked, uh, and the committee uh, had granted to postpone the issue until the last meeting uh, so that I could discuss it and, uh, with, at the SES meeting, which we did. Uh, so at the last SES meeting where I brought it up, we decided we did not need to hold back on, uh, dynamic import. So at this last meeting, um, uh, dynamic import did make it to stage four. So it's basically, it is now uh, done. Uh, uh, dynamic import will be part of the next ECMAScript spec. Um, uh, there's there's um, um, likewise a big int uh, propose, uh, went to stage four. That was with no controversy at all. Uh, so big int is now part of the language, will be part of the next spec. Um, uh, uh, the uh, atomics weight async was I think just refining a weakness in how it was specified rather than some, than any substantive issue. Um, Weak reps made it to stage three. That's, that's uh, a big deal. Before moving on from atomics. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, I, I was talking to Michael Fig yesterday. And um, so, so I, I raised the point about uh, Spectre and shared array buffer. Um, and the fact that it relied on the fact that it can very quickly know across more than one context stuff through a shared array buffer if solving the problem hysterically by you know uh demoting progress of shared array buffer where it could have been solved by adding latency to atomics um, no it can't, it can't be solved adding latency to atomics the problem is that you can use shared array buffer in a racy manner um, where there's no guarantees, but the way it's actually implemented universally is such that without any atomic operations, you just have uh, one thread just looping, indexing, I'm sorry, incrementing, looping, in incrementing one location in memory. And then in the other thread, you keep sampling it. You now have an incredibly high resolution timer it's outside the spec because it's racy. The spec doesn't guarantee anything. But uh, in fact, you have a high resolution timer that, um, uh, that you can now use practically to read side channels like the Meltdown Inspector type side channels. Uh, if you want to be reading those side channels, you would not go through atomics. You would just go through racy memory. Mm -hmm. All right, so I guess, um... A little beyond my, uh, you know, uh, comfort zone of, of actually, uh, you know, understanding all the details. But yeah, um, good to know. <laughs> yeah, um, weak rest made it to stage three. Uh, that was also one where I had held it back on the previous meeting uh, because of the issue of namespace. Where do the names get stack and get stack get stack string appear? Um, they cannot appear on, you know, uh, on something reachable from standard globals because then you cannot virtualize them in a differential manner between different compartments inside the same root realm. I propose them on the system object. There are objections to the system object. Um, uh, as um, uh, so, uh, we agreed that. 
uh, because we're going forward, we're going to stop adding things to the global object. So there's, the global object is not going to be one that continues to grow more globals as specified as part of standard JavaScript, but we're going to try to move future growth into growth of built-in modules that a secure environment like SES uh, can simply know about dangerous new globals like get stack and get stack string as special cases and just omit them from the whitelist. Um, and then move the real attention to uh, namespace quarantine uh, into the management of the namespace for built-in modules. And I'll get back to built-in modules in a moment. Um, top level weight made it stage three. Um, uh, uh, promise.any is just kind of filling out the matrix of promise combinators. Um, uh, uh, promise dot uh, race, uh, its dual is promise dot all settled. Uh, uh, promise dot any is the proper dual to promise dot all. Uh, and if nobody wants to dive into that, I'll just leave it there. It's, it's all documented very clearly. And there's, there's just, just, you know, filling things out for uniformity. Um, for an enumeration order from the title of the proposal, I had hoped that Kevin was going to, Kevin Gibbons was going to bring us to agreement on an actual deterministic spec. Um, but uh, no such luck. We still are not uh, where we can get um, universal consensus on one deterministic spec from that. But there was uh, progress here on agreement to make it more deterministic, to, to, to disambiguate more of the foreign enumeration order. So that's progress, but, but still a long way from determinism. Uh, then the big deal that um, uh, I'll just mention, explain briefly here, uh, but is worth its own session for us to talk about, especially if we can get, um, especially Michael Saboff to join us for a meeting on this topic, uh, is uh, JavaScript standard libraries. Um, uh, we need to stop polluting the global namespace uh, uh, as JavaScript proceeds as the as tc39 proceeds to codify more functionality as standard library provided by the language with temporal uh being the big example uh, uh the, the one that will probably be the first to um uh explicitly join javascript as a standard library uh we need to decide what the namespace is that distinguishes uh, standard libraries that are added as part of the JavaScript language and therefore added by approval from TC39 versus namespace that is, uh, uh, um, uh, that is occupied by users of JavaScript, uh, including perhaps namespaces that other standards committees might want to reserve uh, which leads to an interesting governance issue. This was also discussed uh, with Michael Saboff uh, at um, TC53, the uh, embedded systems. Um, uh, uh, and the, uh, so there was a big political fight where the W3C is yet again uh, trying to blur the lines between JavaScript and host. Um, uh, kind of under the belief that, that the browser is the only host that matters uh, and not understanding or not appreciating that the JavaScript versus host separation is why JavaScript uh, versus host is, is such a good analog of user mode versus system mode. So we had a big fight about that and it's, um, we need to go forward with a, a, JavaScript specific namespace. Uh, and then with regard to reserving other top level names, um, uh, it, 
we need to beware of the political issues that always come when you try to centrally administer a human readable namespace in an open world. Uh, we might accidentally um, uh, end up reproducing all the political problems that the ICANN had um, uh, um, trying to administer the top level namespace. Um, uh, for the uh, on this particular topic, um, there's a very disturbing thread in which um, um, the pressure was made on uh, JDD to give up um, his NPM um, um, uh, STD namespace in order for STD to become the standard JavaScript <laughs> uh, namespace. And when you read a thread like this involving people involved with the specs, you kind of like, like I initially thought him having STD as, you know, STD slash ESM, that, that was cool. But when I saw this thread and I saw that, you know, there's a, a proposal being presented that builds off of like the very gracious, uh, you know, upon pressure, obviously, um, for, for some, you know, popular, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know what the reasoning is, but if the world is like that, um, you know, uh, the, it, it's really uh, bad to have a namespace for JavaScript that is STD just because, you know, there's this thread out there. Yeah, the, the, the uh, central proposal for the standard namespace for JavaScript would be a JS colon prefix. Yeah. Uh, and the issue um, uh, with, with, some, with identifier colon as a prefix is then these things look like URLs um, and in a namespace that already accepts URLs. Yeah. Um, so a proposal that had been made on an issue thread somewhere that I don't remember if it was explicitly mentioned during the meeting uh, is that any such prefix actually get registered uh, with, the, uh, with the IANA yeah. or wherever one registers uh, URI prefixes, protocols. Thank you, um, thank you, thank you. Because that's what I recommended to Node about Node.js colon. Um, and they were like module, um, um, module specifiers are not URLs. So, you know, this debate is killed if you're going to have force people to use file colon. Uh, so don't tell me it's not module URLs just because you're afraid to put it in the spec and you keep coming to the point that you want to use uh, identifier colon in many things around them. Yeah, yeah, and there, there, and there already is a governance procedure that the world accepts <laughs> of the IANA. I think that's the one that uh, one registers um, uh, URI protocol names with. Uh, so we, yes. I think we should just delegate to them the governance of the introduction of new protocol names. Uh, yeah. But it would be very good for the JavaScript standard library to, to be JS colon. I don't know if it's still available. Yeah. Uh, but, but we run into problems in the browser um, uh, sphere there. And because, because I have thought about uh, modules being URLs and the ramifications of globals and the ramifications of standard libraries. Like I've, I've thought of this for like the past three years in so many different ways, uh, sadly alone. <laughs> uh, but if you are going to have browsers um, um, have standard libraries, then, then um, it's going to be problematic for them to find such a thing that they can register and agree on. Very, very difficult. Um, because you, you throw, if you import something that um, is not known by the platform, and if you're importing a built-in of a browser by running uh, a module in a browser that you don't yet know what it is, um, then uh, it being different, a different prefix for each browser is going to be very problematic. And I don't think browser two dots, like browser colon is something that anyone wants to entertain. Mm -hmm. so, so I think JS um, can be JS, um, followed by, you know, 
uh, domain, and here domain we're talking about, if you're not JS, you can be the domain slash, and the domain here would be browser slash. So I think what people were proposing, if the, if the W3C ends up uh, occupying namespace for the browser as a host, is I think people were thinking of web colon. Um, oh. But, but the, the thing that I feel strongly about is just uh, uh, the JavaScript namespace, and then as much as possible, us not creating a new worldwide governance procedure for administering top level names of the namespace. Uh, the world does not need new politics like that. Um, so let's see. Um, yeah, I agree with both of those positions. Definitely, definitely. And, and thank you so much for being very, very to the point with them because I've tried to raise concerns in that realm, um, like in, in this area of the discussions. And it's very hard to argue when people tell you, well, module specifiers are not URLs. Well, just because you write stuff in the spec um, and you have that privilege, it doesn't mean that you could argue at me what is actually very false. We all use module specifiers as URLs, uh, you know, especially those who claim that they are not, are very, very strict about making sure that they are. Uh, so so you, you found really good points um, to, to hammer on, on this issue. So thank okay. you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, it's now 3 o'clock. I actually have a 3 o'clock meeting. Uh, some of the remaining things are definitely worth talking about, uh, but we should uh, postpone all of that to the next meeting. That's great. All right. Thank you so much for, um, you know, all, all the uh, updates. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, you, you're recording, so you should stop recording, and then I'll go ahead and upload. Okay.